Hi. Korg's Chaos Replay takes inspiration from the XYPad-centric interface of their old Chaos products, but it's really its own thing. It has 16 velocity-sensitive pads, it can sample, resample, and play back samples and whole songs. The Chaos Effects Control touchpad has a high-res touchscreen, which you can also use to edit samples and use as a live processing machine for 128 built-in effects. It's got DJ-style mix, cue, and group controls with two faders, and it can also, with some limitations, be used as a basic live looper. In this video, I'll take a detailed look at what it can do and explore its pros and cons in light of the competition, including the SP404 Mark II, MPC-1, Black Box, and others. Before I start, a quick disclosure. Cork sent replay over for review. No money changed hands. They have no say over the content of this video and don't get to see it before it's published. This channel is funded mainly by viewers who subscribe to exclusive content and book updates on Patreon, YouTube Premium and ads, and price check affiliate links in the description, which help the channel regardless of the product you choose to buy. Okay, let's start with an overview. Replay has a 5-inch high-resolution touchscreen. It's got great viewing angles and XY touch control for one of 128 built-in effects you can choose from. You can use the effects depth knob to control the depth of the effect. And of course the X and Y axes choose different parameters, which unfortunately aren't shown on screen. They probably could add that uh, pretty easily because it's a high res screen. Though of course, I don't know if they plan to do that. When you release your finger, the effect will stop. You can add an effects release toggle or just hold the effect and do something else. And you can also record pad motions and have that play back up to 12 seconds. Besides being a touchscreen, you can also move around it with this encoder and select parameters and edit them by pressing the encoder. Then you've got 16 velocity sensitive touchpads for, as you may have guessed, triggering samples. Each pad can either hold, let's get into trigger edit, a one-shot sample, in which case it's velocity sensitive, or a loop, which will repeat itself. Though I think they need to add a crossfade for cases where you didn't trim your loop exactly right. And besides one-shots and loops, you can also load up entire songs and stream them from the SD card. You can't change the pad colors, they're matched accordingly with red for one-shot samples, and then blue for loops, and whole songs are in pink. Notice that I toggled the pads on and off to start and stop them. There aren't any envelopes, uh, but there is a gate mode, in which case pads will play for as long as you press them. Aside from playing back files you load up into here, you can also sample resample audio coming through the main output. And with some limitations, use this as a looper. I'll show you that later on. In terms of recording time, you can record up to 30 minutes into a single pad. And there's also a live record option, which lets you record the entire output of the machine in stereo. And that lasts up to 100 minutes. Korg hasn't told me exactly how much internal memory this has, but they say it's not something you need to think about because samples are streamed from the SD card. My unit came with an eight gig SD card and it can handle up to 32 gigabytes. You can't play samples chromatically, but you can load different notes into different pads. There's 16 pad polyphony and projects have eight pages. You double tap to get to the second page in each of the pages, A through D and E through H. And you can move between the pages seamlessly and trigger any pad from any page. And it has a smart way of prioritizing voices so that songs aren't interrupted by one shot. And if you forget what's playing where, 
there's an all notes off. So you've got immediate access to 128 samples and loading and saving projects does take a bit and playback needs to stop in between projects. Since there's no internal memory, samples don't work unless you've got an SD card plugged in. The next main control element on replay are the faders. You can assign any pad you like to any fader group as well as the line input. And you do that just by holding the group button and selecting the pads that you wanna be in the group or the line input, in which case it'll blink. The next important control element in Chaos Replay is or are these 12 program memory slash hot cue buttons. So by default, you use them to select an effect. And this can include a saved effect depth, as well as motion recording if you want. And then their other function is as hot cues. So to edit hot cues, or to choose a pad for hot cues, you select it, and you can add hot cues. So let's say I want to add one here. Let's say here, and then maybe another one here, and another one here. And I can jump to these hot cues. And the red one is the active one. There's no quantization for this, by the way, which would have been nice. And you can't set loops. And you can also see this visually if I go into edit. Then you can see the hot cues here. You can also edit these manually and delete hot cues if you want. A very nice feature hot cues and you can have up to 12 of them and these are 12 per pad so for this song these are the hot cues and if I play this song activate it then I can set up different hot cues in here scroll around and go back and forth so hot cues are per pad then tempo is a pretty big deal here because you can align playback of loops and songs to the internal tempo with time stretch. There's a tap tempo. You can set the BPM using the encoder or use auto BPM that aligns the internal tempo to the audio coming in through the line input. Then beside that, there are a few other buttons to control various other functions. For example, mutes. So you choose pads you want to mute by holding mute. Then you can turn on and off mutes and there's solo, which does the same thing for the pads you select. And of course there's shift for everything that's labeled above the buttons. So for example, to turn off all the solos. And then in terms of connectivity on the back, right to left are two USB jacks, USB-C just for power using the included power adapter. And then another USB port, micro USB, unfortunately for MIDI file transfer and audio. USB audio gives you two channels in and 34 channels out, a main mix and then a stereo pair for each of the pads. Then you've got a foot switch input, which if we go to the global settings, you can choose to activate resampling, sampling, touch, hold and tap tempo, which is very nice. Then you've got five pin MIDI in and out for clock sync, MIDI control, or using replay as a MIDI controller, which obviously works through the USB jack as well. Then you've got two RCA style line outputs, two RCA line or phono inputs with a line slash phono switch. Then finally on the back is a 3.5 millimeter aux through. This goes out directly to the line output using an analog connection. So you can't sample this audio or apply effects to it. It also doesn't send audio to the computer over USB. Then on the front, you've got a micro SD card slot. And then on the right, a microphone input, no phantom power, but you've got a gain or trim option, and then a monitor headphone output with a dedicated volume control. You can control what gets sent out to this using this crossfader, either the main audio, meaning whatever you play, or whatever you set to send to the monitor channel. So say, if I activate this song, I can now hear it through the main mix. If I hit monitor and tap this pad, it'll disconnect it from the main output. I'll obviously need headphones, and I could crossfade between the level of this and the level of the main mix, and whenever I wanna bring it back or bring it in using a fader, I can turn levels down of how I control it, then hit monitor, disable it, and either directly or gradually bring it in. 
The build overall feels very solid. It's a sturdy all metal enclosure. The knobs are a bit small, but I got used to them and this can't be battery powered. Okay, let's dive in a little bit deeper and start by looking at how you load samples into the project. One option is off the SD card. You hit shift and trigger pad edit, tap import, and you can navigate through the different folders on the SD card. Pretty clear what's going on. I've got my album here and just uh, choose a song I want to load, the destination pad that I want to load it to. Let's say this one. I can choose to either set the BPM or auto detect the BPM. This process takes a while, so I recommend knowing the BPM of your song and just setting it manually if you can, and then hit OK, and it'll import the song into the pad. And for songs, you probably want to remove gate mode, and you can just play the song back, or go ahead and edit the song, trim it, or designate it as a one-shot or a loop. We'll get to this in a bit. If you've got this connected using the USB connection, you can hit Shift and Surface and go into SD Reader mode. Let's uh, save these changes. And now the SD card will appear as a drive on your computer. You can drag and drop files onto the SD card, then exit this mode, and files that you added will appear when you go ahead to import files to pads. The process of assigning files to pads is a bit tedious. You always end up at the uh, main folder. You've got to dig in, and then you can preview loops. Where is your... And then just import them. Let's say go into this pad and you need to touch here for some reason, select the pad. Again, auto detect the BPM. Let's do auto detect, see what happens. So it takes it a while, even for a short loop. And now we have this loop assigned to this pad. The thing is, like I mentioned, it's a bit tedious. So if I want to import to another pad, again, go to import again, go down the folders and uh, let's go for this, import. And again, touch here. So I think they could do a bit better in speeding this up. And one more thing I think that can be done better, notice there's a file name here. Once I press OK, the file name will be gone. All I'll get is just the pad that I have here. Since there's such a nice high res screen, it would be nice if they kept the file name. Uh, maybe you'd see it when you edit pads or something so that if you come back to a project after a while, you'll have something other than the pad bank and number. So that's how you get audio into here, except of course sampling. Once you've got audio in the trigger pad edit screen, you can choose to designate it as a loop, one shot or a song. You can see the parameters change a bit between these three options. Let's maybe choose a song. You've got an overview of the entire sample up here and you can see eight seconds here in the middle. You can't zoom in further though. You can edit the start and end points either by using the encoder, which is a bit tedious, but also just by moving the start or end point to the middle line and then pressing S and say E. You'll wanna make sure it got the BPM right, so you can edit that. And shift will give you a different resolution for the data entry encoder. Exclusive assign lets you set choke groups. So say for example, for drums, snare or hi-hats, I could set choke groups if I wanted. Here, by the way, I did set choke groups for loops because I only wanted to be able to play one of these loops at a time. Now this is pad edit mode, so I can't perform with this, but you saw me perform with this in the intro and I'll talk about sync and quantize in a bit. Then level lets you set the relative level of a pad. And loop length lets you set the length of loops. I kind of cheated here, by the way. Chaos Replay only supports four four rhythms, so four beats in a bar. This song is in six eights, actually, so it evens out after 12 beats. It would be nice, of course, if they supported other time signatures, but right now that's what you got. This little graphics will show you how many beats you've got in your loop, and you can use this link button to link the start and end points. So when they're linked, the end point will drag the start point along and when they're not, here we go, then it won't. You can also set a start offset if you want. And that's pretty much it for loops. One shots are even simpler. You can just choose a start and end point. There's no way to zoom in even further when you're on the zoomed in screen, the eight seconds, which would have been nice if you need to trim the start or end spot precisely. Let's move on and talk about time stretch, meaning changing the speed of a loop or song so that it plays at a different tempo. Let's take, for example, 
this sample. So stop playback. It is at 90 BPM and our current BPM out is 80. So it's playing faster, but if we hit sync, then it'll stay at the same pitch, but slow down. This works pretty nicely for uh, rhythmic loops. Obviously at an extreme, you'll hear the granular effect, but uh, it's decent, I think, for uh, rhythmic loops. For melodic loops, it kind of gets choppy. Very close to the original BPM, by the way. So this is the original native tempo of the clip. Sounds good, but the minute we veer off a little bit, Especially if we slow it down, it gets a bit warbly. That's the native VPN. Let's say we try this. Yeah, here the native VPN is 126. Oops. Hear that bit of choppiness? So that's the time stretch algorithm. Both songs and loops can be synced from the native VPM to the BPM out, to the reference VPM. And you can also launch them without uh, sync if you like. But if you do, and let's get out of trigger edit mode, then everything's in sync, which is why we want to use time stretch. Now, you'll notice that they're in sync with the tempo, but not in sync with each other. That's what the quantize function is for. And it will make sure that regardless of when I press any one of the pads, any one of the loops, they'll be in sync, both with each other and with the main reference tempo of the machine, which I can change and time stretch both loops. Together. You change the degree of quantization in the global settings, and there are options all the way from an eighth of a beat to a beat to every two beats. There's no four beat option, so a measure option, I think they should add that, and hopefully that's pretty easy. Now, beside time stretch, we've also got a variable pitch option. So let's take, for example, this loop. For this, you need to first add the pad to the pads that will be affected by variable pitch, then activate variable pitch and play the loop. And then you need to change the tempo after you have pressed play. And then you can uh, slow down the loop with pitch shift. This works very nicely, by the way, with a tape or record-like effect, even at extreme levels. So very cool, I think. The only thing that's a bit odd about how this feature works is that the variable pitch is relative. So it's not absolute setting tempo, doesn't set the absolute tempo of the clip, but rather the pitch and time shift are relative to the tempo of whatever the tempo was when you press the pad. So the numbers you're seeing here aren't absolute, but rather relative. I think it would also be nice if they let you set the relative pitch as opposed to the relative tempo. So now that we know how to get samples in here, let's take a look at the chaos effects and let's just go through all of them very quickly. I think what I'll do is just record a motion and uh, yeah, replay that and then just go through the effects quickly, give you a taste of them. The effects are arranged in groups. The first group is filters. Then a group of modulation effects. And then what are called LFO effects, meaning effects that are tempo synced. Quite a few of the effects are.
and then a bunch of delay effects. A few reverbs. Nice ones, I think. And then the Chaos Looper style effects. And then there are a few vocoder effects. So let's load up a different sample for that. Where is your heart? That's the original. Is it, where is your heart? Is it, is it in the sky? Where is I don't think she needs auto tune, but I sure do. Is your heart? Is it up in the sky? Where is the love? Is it down in the mountain? Is it down in the Is is it down? Where is your heart? Is it up in the sky? Is it down in the bones? Where is your heart? Up in the sky. Where is the love? Is it down? Where is your heart? Is where is your heart? So that's quite a lot of vocoders if you're into that. And then there are a few swoosh or transition style effects. I think these could be actually pretty useful. And a few synths. You can't set uh, scales for these, which would be nice. Hopefully they can add that. So yes, yay, we finished 128 effects. And if you like what you found and you like a motion you've recorded and then effect depth, then you can write it into any one of the program memory buttons and recall it. Let's move on and talk about sampling. You can sample either the line input, the mic input, or USB audio, as well as resample the internal audio. Sampling is easy. You need to set up whether you want to record a loop and how long you want it to be, or if you just want to record a one-shot, then you can choose whether you want to trigger recording with a pad or trigger 
based on levels coming in through the input that you're recording. And I'm going to try and sample an SM7B, which is a notoriously low level microphone. But let's do it anyway. I'll crank the trim all the way up and I need to activate the mic input. So now this is just the SM7B and while we're here, shift and setup can go into the mic settings. I can add reverb, light, hey, hey, and delay, 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 as well as apply EQ. Anyway, we go back into sampling. You can see I'm triggering threshold. Choose the pad that I want to queue up for this. With trigger, I need to arm it, arm, arm, hey. Arm it, arm, arm, hey. And we now have arm it, arm, arm, hey. Our sample, and of course I can go ahead and edit it. And what would have certainly arm it, been arm, nice arm, here hey. is a normalization option. Now you can also use this as a looper. Let's take a look at that. Since you can record loops in here, the question you might ask is, can this be used as a looper? And the answer is yes, but without a few features you might expect in the looper, which hopefully they'll add in the future, and with a few caveats. So first thing, there's no metronome, so you'll need to record a metronome loop on your own, or just play to a beat. And replay doesn't adjust the tempo to whatever length of loop you record, so it's better to have a tempo loop ready and prepared. So I'll go into sampling, choose the loop length to whatever you want to record, and then you can choose to either auto trigger or press the pad to start recording. I set the trigger as low as possible so that the start point doesn't overshoot the actual loop. Let's sample into this pad. And then the reference BPM really matters, so you want to make sure that your loop is quantized to it. So let's get our metronome going and play loop. And it automatically loops back. That's pretty much it. Let's maybe add another layer. Go into sampling and hit a different pad. Let's do one without auto trigger. So in this case, I'll need to press the pad to start recording. And that'll be the loop start point. So let's do that. So we'll live with this. Now, okay, so sounds great. We have a looper, there's no overdubbing, but uh, everything's working nicely. So first there's no overdub. So if a loop had a tail, that tail would be chopped off as it loops back, which isn't too bad here. And then the second and more important point, I think is that the start point of these loops isn't quantized to the start point of the reference VPM. Now, if I hit it just right, you might not notice a little offset between the piano and the drums, but if I bring in the second loop, it'll start on the first beat when things are quantized. So it'll be completely off compared to how I played it initially. And that's what I think they should fix here. And that's because recording started when I hit this pad, which isn't necessarily the start of the loop. So I think they need to add some sort of quantization option here for when you start recording so that it starts on the one, even if you don't play a note on the one. And then to wrap up sampling, there's a live recording option, which you access with shift and card. It just starts recording and whatever you do with this just gets recorded into a uh, long sample. Shift and live record stops it. And this will be on the SD card in the live record folder. Before we head out to the pros and cons, a few miscellaneous things. I'll go into the global settings. I won't go over all of these, but you can edit and turn off velocity sensitivity. There's no shortcut for this, by the way. There's an effects release when you release the chaos pad. And we already talked about the foot switch. You can also choose to use this as an effect only as opposed to the combination of the dry and wet signal. And there are a whole bunch of MIDI settings we won't go over, but this can be used as a MIDI controller. And if you go into surface mode, you can also use the screen as 10 MIDI CC faders. Okay, let's talk about pros and cons for Chaos Replay. And I think the three relevant competitors to have in mind are the similar in form factor SB404 Mark II from Roland, the Akai MPC-1, and the 1010 Music Black Box. They're all different in their own way, and a video comparing all three to Replay would take hours. But in a very broad and imprecise generalization, I'd say that the main difference between Replay compared to all of them on the hardware side is that Replay isn't intended to be a detailed music production system 
system, it's more of a performance box. So it doesn't have a sequencer, it doesn't have a built-in synth unless they improve the chaos synths and add scales to them, and it doesn't have the ability to play samples chromatically. I kind of cheated here by adding different notes into different pads. And then even though it doesn't have a sequence where you can always resample yourself playing and use that as a loop, so there are ways around that, but it's not a production box, it's a performance box. It's designed mainly for you to bring content you already created and then perform with it and play it back. Another limitation of replay is that other than the mic effects, which we talked about earlier, you only get one effect one global master effect at a time. Now you can apply that effect to different targets within the system. So say only to the pads that are assigned to group B, only to the pads that are assigned to group A, but you can't create a chain of effects and you can't assign one effect to one set of pads and another effect to another set of pads. So that's another limitation that you don't have on the other machines. The effects you do have here, though, of course, are pretty unique and characteristic of the chaos line. I played through all of them earlier, so you can rewind to that section if you like. And Korg hinted that they might add more effects to this, but even as it is now, the 128 effects that are in here are fairly unique and let you get quite creative, even though only one at a time. Another important feature here is the up to 30 minute song length, all streaming for the SD card, which some but not all of the others have. This is also very DJ friendly with groups, two faders and a monitor mix option. The only thing that comes close to this is the DJ mode in the SP404. I think pros on the hardware side for Chaos Replay are the simplicity and immediacy of the hardware controls, including the dual faders, the pads, and the 12 Q controls per sample, along with the XY pad and the motion recording. I think the amplified microphone input, though no phantom power, is also fairly unique. The way you can live loop here also is pretty interesting with the limitations that I mentioned earlier. Quantization for launching loops is very useful, though time stretch for melodic samples I think needs improvement. And then the 100 minute live recording buffer I think is a very nice cherry on top that's unique to this. Then cons on the firmware side, meaning things I hope we can get firmware updates for, but there's absolutely no promise that we will. Probably the biggest thing I think they could do better is that the high res screen is very underutilized. At the very least, I would expect to see what the X and Y parameters control when you're using the chaos pad as an effect. It would also be great to see the waveforms as you press the pads. You can do that today when you go into the trigger edit screen, but that's just a way to view and edit one pad at a time and you need to press it twice before it plays back. And speaking of DJ features, I think quantization of cue points would be useful as well, as well as the option to create loops within a sample. So for example, if I set Q.1 and Q.2, I'd want an option to loop this point. Again, you can work around this with a resampling and create a new loop if you want and then trim it, but I think quantized looping with Q points would be ideal. I think they should also add simple envelopes when you're in gate mode, say to have a uh, smooth release when you release a pad. And then I talked about importing samples. It's a bit tedious to go through these folders one by one. An editor would of course be ideal, like the one on the SP404 Mark II, but at the very least, maybe perhaps a batch import would be nice. And then finally, what I'd love to see as a firmware update is the ability to play a sample chromatically so that we don't need to cheat and load up samples on a pad by pad basis to play scales with samples. So that's it for Chaos Replay. I'll be making this project available if you do wanna get started with something on my Patreon. And if you liked the insights in this video, there are plenty more in my ever-expanding book of electronic music ideas, tips, and tricks, also available on my Patreon. Hit like if this was useful, ring the YouTube bell below if you wanna make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.